This program is brought to you by Abiding Above Ministries. Take God's Word and turn to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 18. We'll look at verses uh, 1 through 8. My friend, we're living in desperate days. I mean, anyone who peruses any newspaper or news magazine or somewhat keeps up with the news, which all of us should pay attention. That doesn't mean you have to go to see it on the local news. But if you're paying attention to what's going on in our nation and around the world, you can know that we're in desperate days in this nation. It seems as though we are in a moral and financial freefall. And it's like we don't know how to stop and we don't know when we're going to hit. But everyone is feeling the effects of these days. On one hand, it makes us just angry. But on another hand, it makes us sad. But realistically, what lies ahead for us is some dark days. You say, well, Chris, that's negative. Well, you've got to be a realist in ministry. If you're going to minister and teach and preach the Word of God, you have to tell the truth. You can't worry about being popular. Why? Because people need to prepare for the days that are just ahead of us. There's never been a nation that has continued to turn its back on God that continued to exist. God brings them down when they choose to permanently turn their back. On the Creator. In times like these, we need to remember that long before there was a United States of America, there was God. God has always existed and always will exist. In this brief moment we call time, yes, there is a United States of America. But do you know we are a baby nation compared to the rest of the nations on earth who have a history of thousands of years? We're just a baby nation. You say, how do you explain America? There's only one way to explain the United States of America, God. That's it. How we've done so much in short 200 years compared to other countries of the world can only be explained by the fact that God has had his hand on this nation. There's no other way to explain it. We cannot fully know what lies ahead, but we do know who holds the future. We know that God is in control. If we have put our trust for our eternity, the fact that we're going to leave this earth one day, all of us, and we're putting our faith and our trust in the fact that He's going to care for us for all eternity, if we can put our trust in Him for that, we can put our trust in Him for these days just ahead of us in this nation. And so, with that in mind, I want to talk tonight about in times like these. And that's the title of this message, in times like these. The first point I'd like to make is the scarcity of faith. The scarcity of faith. Look at uh, Luke chapter um, 18 and look at uh, the first verse there where it says, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Now, to understand this passage, you have to look at both chapters 17 and 18, because Jesus is speaking of his coming again. My friend, he came the first time as a baby, and he's right on time. He's going to come again, and I think he's coming very soon. Prophecy always is fulfilled in the Word of God. Many people think that his coming is delayed. It's not delayed. It's all in God's timing that we don't always understand. Some people simply doubt that Jesus will come again. But I personally believe, as your pastor, I believe Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming soon. I will not predict the day or the hour because I don't know it. No one does. But I believe that he's coming in my lifetime and I'm a 50-year-old man. 
I believe that with all my heart. Chris, are you predicting a time? I did not. I can't tell you. Nobody knows except the Father, Jesus said. But I believe he's coming very, very soon. When he comes, will he really find faith on the earth? This is a question that seems to presuppose that he will not. Look at verse 8 of Luke 18. It says, will he really find faith on the earth? It's almost as if it's doubtful that he will. For many years, we've witnessed the decline of faith in God in America and around the world. Sometimes it seems to go unnoticed, especially here in the South, because there is a culture here in the South of going to church. That's what we do. And uh, a lot of people go to church faithfully, more than likely, that have never truly been born again. They've never been born from above. And a lot of the ailments of the local church is because that many churches have many people who've never truly been born again, though they never miss. You say, can that be possible? Oh, yes, it's possible. You see it everywhere you go. A lot of people in churches that have never truly been converted. And so, you get away from the south and you travel along the east coast. You talk to people there. You look at the churches there. And there's not a culture of Christianity, a culture of church going as we have here. And you begin to see, wow, this nation is a dark nation. Now, when it says in verse 8, will he really find faith on the earth, which where it's talking about the fact that he is going to, to come again, and it presupposes that maybe he will not. What is it talking about when it talks about faith there? The kind of faith that would be against apostasy. So, it's presupposing that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to earth, he's probably not going to really find faith. It's the way it's looking. So there's going to be a scarcity of faith. And the kind of faith that he's talking about here is a kind of faith, when it's real, that is absolutely against apostasy. Now, you say, what's apostasy? It is an abandoning of what one has believed in as a faith or principle. And when we say the faith among Christians, what we're talking about is the doctrines of the Scripture. The faith. When you talk about having faith, we're talking about the fact that even though I can't see God, I believe in Him and I believe in Him according to His Word. I have faith. But when it's talking about the faith, it's talking about the doctrines of the Word of God. There is going to be a scarcity on earth. When the Lord Jesus comes back, I believe He's coming soon, there's going to be a scarcity of faith. The kind of faith that would be against apostasy. We've been seeing this in our nation for years. Evil is growing worse and worse. Let's look at chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. And he spoke a parable unto them, to this end, that men ought always to pray and not faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge says. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, 
When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? So, will he find faith on the earth? The kind of faith that will be against apostasy. You see, men just like the unjust judge in this passage will populate the land when Jesus Christ comes back. They'll be everywhere. What will they be like, Chris? No fear of God and no regard for man. Are we not living in a political climate these days, 2012, where there is no fear of God and no regard for man? We have no principled leaders. And here we are, Southern Baptists, being forced to vote for someone who's part of a cult. We're living in desperate, dark days. No fear of God, no regard for man. Jesus said this man, in this parable here, did not fear God. And the unjust judge in this parable said of himself that he did not fear God. You see that in verse 4. And we're living in a country that is filled with preaching, teaching, and bookstores filled with Bibles and Bible studies. But look what's happening to us. How can we have so much information and be in the state that we're in? People do not care who God is anymore. It's almost as if they don't think of the fact that there is a God who's watching. So, they eat, they drink, and marry as if nothing is wrong. Look back at uh, verses um, 26 and 27 of uh, Luke uh, chapter 17. Listen to what it says here. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. You know what this is saying? This is not saying there's anything wrong with drinking and eating and marrying and giving in marriage. What it's saying is this. Everyone's going to be going along normally. Just another day. And then the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come. And when he comes, what is he going to find? He's going to find a scarcity of faith. A faith that would be against apostasy. And we're living in a time of apostasy. No fear of God and no regard for man. You see, we have been parked on other people's nickel. I think Tom Brokaw wrote a book uh, called... um, the greatest generation. And basically, some of you are still alive. Praise God for you. It was men and women who came out of the Great Depression, who did not grow up with a silver spoon in their mouth, did not always have everything they desired. They always had everything they needed, but not all that they desired. It was a time where the communications age wasn't like it is now, where there's instant communication. An instant gratification. It was a time where you had just enough to make it and maybe just enough to give to your neighbor just a little bit and they would give to you. It was a different time than what any of us have ever experienced. These men and women that came through that time grew up with a work ethic that is far superior than anything we've ever seen. And now we're living in a day and age where there is no work ethic anymore in this nation. That's all gone. And what we've enjoyed in this nation, the prosperity, and what we built in this nation, some call it the American dream, we've enjoyed because of those men and women that came out of the Great Depression who worked and moved forward. We're living in a culture today that young ministers are crying out against what we have known as the American dream. And I know there's pros and cons to the American dream. I understand that. But isn't it interesting that that American dream, that moms and dads who worked hard and lived frugal lives and saved money and put it in retirement accounts to draw interest and think about the future and think about their family and all these things, isn't it interesting 
that the money that they made by living disciplined lives is the money that they put their kids through school. Not one degree, not two degrees, three degrees, and then a master, and then a doctorate. And those same young men in ministry and in other vocations cry out against America when they've enjoyed it, they've been spoiled by it. We're parked on the nickel of the greatest generation in America. But I believe that is expired. I think it's over with. I think that's expired. This kind of faith is against apostasy, but it's also against depravity. Let's see the times of Lot. Look again at Luke 17. You you see, to understand this parable, you have to look at Luke 17 and 18. In Luke 17, 28, 29, it talks about the times of Lot. Verses 28 and 29, likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they listened to their iPods, they planted, they built, and they regularly went to church and uh, washed their cars and waxed their cars and checked their retirement accounts. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. You see, the tragedy in our day is that We glamorize and rationalize immorality, greed, and lust, and deceit. This is why we now see faith is scarce in our days. So, when you think about the faith that's going to be scarce when Jesus comes again, according to chapter 17, that faith would be against apostasy, we see apostasy in our land. That faith would be against depravity, we see that in our land. That faith is of a minority. Look at verse 7 of Luke uh, chapter uh, 18. It says, And shall not God avenge His own elect, which cry day and night unto Him, though He bear long with them? God always has a remnant. What did he do? He led Lot and his family out, and then he judged Sodom and Gomorrah. What did he do? He led Noah and his family out and into the ark, and then he flooded the whole earth. God always has a remnant. You see it in Noah's day. You see it in Lot's day. And listen, I pray that you see it in our day, and I pray that you and I are part of this. I'm not talking about election in this Message, I'm talking about those who are truly born again. Not just a southern cultural, we go to church and these things, but I'm talking about people who've genuinely had a relationship with God, who've been born again, born from above, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Regeneration. This faith is of a minority. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18? He said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Does it say that there would not be an all-out attack? Because, my friend, we're in an all-out attack on the church. But it says, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. You see, God with his minority means far more than the majority. God with his minority means far more than majority. The majority of the United States may say we're on a highway to hell and proud of it. But you know what? It's not going to stop what God intends for us as his children and us as this nation if we turn toward him. So the question is this. It's not whether Jesus is going to come back again because he is. His coming back is not delayed. It's not his timing yet. His first coming was right on time. In the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. He's going to come again, just like the Bible says that He is. And according to this scripture and this parable, looking at chapter 17 and 18, when He comes back, apparently there's going to be a scarcity of faith. Will He find faith? Question mark. A faith that's against apostasy, depravity. A faith that is of a minority. More and more you're going to feel like a remnant. 
I began to feel that way now. For the last couple of years, I felt like, this is what I have felt like. About two and a half years ago, I began to realize probably the wisest thing I could do was plant a church. About two and a half years ago, I began to think this. And this was my thinking. I had been studying some in Christian history, and I had been studying about the Puritans and also the Separatists and the Catholic Church. And I began to see what the pilgrims did and the way they were. And I, I began to think, you know, I feel like when I go to churches and see what's going on, I feel like, man, we just need to start all over again. You ever felt that way? Let's just start over. I mean, somebody put on the brakes and say, let's start over again. We've become so worldly in our churches. And I began to to just almost visualize, I think I'll just plant a church. It'll be a more traditional church. And we're going to keep the focus on the teaching of the Word of God. You listen to whatever music you want to listen to during the week. But when you come to church, be planning with a notebook and paper and Bible. We're going to learn in the short time that we're on this property. And I began to visualize almost like those pilgrims getting on the Mayflower and began to sail to America, not knowing if they would even get here. But aren't you glad they did? That small handful of people that got on that boat and came here, and they fought, they fought disease and all kinds of things, but aren't you glad they did? Look what we've enjoyed, and look how the gospel is spread across the world because they came across here. And I began to say, you know what? That seems mighty slow to me. I don't want to start with a handful of people. I, I'd rather start with two or 3,000. I'm just like anybody else. I think those ways. But you know, I began to realize Jesus only had 12, really 11. And I said, you know what? The economy's going to crumble. There's no stopping it. China owns us, but nobody talks about it. They own us. And I got to thinking, you know, the way we've been doing things, we can't keep doing things the way we've always done things. We can't do that anymore. There's not going to be the money to do it. And I began to think, why not prepare yourself, Chris, for what deep down you know is going to happen out there? And so my prayer is to be a part of the remnant that still sees the faith the doctrines of the Word of God, and in everyday living, still walking by faith, though sometimes fearful, sometimes not understanding, but knowing this, nothing can get to his sheep unless it comes from the shepherd. And if he allows it, then it may be for a purification somehow. I don't know. But I know this. He who has begun a good work in me will fulfill it. Same thing with you. And so, let's remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7. As we think about the remnant here, those who are going to be here, and when he's looking for faith, when he comes again, he's going to look, he's going to see you. In Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate that, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Listen, there is already a scarcity of faith. People can talk about attending church. People can talk about being for God. But when you look and watch people live their lives now, you find very few people who just simply walk with Jesus anymore. It's total compromise wherever you look. There is a scarcity of faith. That's the first thing. Second thing is this, real faith. Look again at verse 8 of uh, Luke chapter 18. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. When he comes, will Jesus find real faith? My friend, real faith always prays. Look back again at verse 1 of Luke chapter 18. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought, 
sometimes to pray. What does it say? Men ought always to pray and not faint. Say, so Chris, what's real faith look like? It is a faith that's so confident in the Lord Jesus Christ, blessed be His name, who He is, that they walk by faith, always praying without ceasing, in an attitude of prayer. True spirituality is found with an ability to pray. Not routine prayers. God bless this food and nourish my body. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. That's the meal. But what about walking, talking, listening to God day by day, seven days a week? Not bits and pieces of prayer strung together that you have heard from others, but simply talking to God is prayer. Real faith involves praying. But real prayer is evidence of real faith. So, faith, real faith, prays, but it also persists. Look again at verse 5 of Luke 18. It says, Yet because, talking about this widow, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Lest by her continual coming she weary me. Now in the Greek, she weary me means she gives me eyes that are black and blue. That means she keeps coming to me Over and over and over, she persists, she wearies me. Black and blue eyes is what that literally means. This speaks of her persistence. This speaks of her faith. To sum up this parable, listen to this statement. To sum this parable up, this parable can be summed up this way. If this brute of a man who has no fear of God, who has no regard for man, which is our political landscape these days. If this brute of a man who does not fear God nor regard man will bow to persistent faith, what will God do who waits to speedily meet the needs of his people? So, on one hand, this message can be sobering. But on another hand, this message, and I'm not finished yet, but on another hand, this message can also be an encouragement. I'm going to show you why. Basically, it's this. God is going to take care of His remnant no matter what. He's going to. So don't be anxious, but live with your eyes wide open. Be a blessing. Be a help. Go back to the basics. Get out your Bible and begin to prepare yourself doctrinally. Begin to know what you believe and begin to show others what you're learning. Because I'm telling you, dark days are coming. And so, this kind of faith persists. Our praise and this kind of faith persists. This all speaks to us, His children, about faith that does not lose heart. I haven't lost heart. I tell you what I've lost heart in. I love America. I do. I'm patriotic. You can ask my wife. We got an American flag and we put it out on our, in the front yard uh, around the uh, celebration days. But I tell you what, I have lost faith in America. I have. Right now, I've lost faith in America. But I have not lost faith in God. And who was first? God. Who made America what it is? God, I have not lost faith in the one who's blessed us and made us, but I have lost faith in America because of the state that it's in and where we are. But not in God. So, this faith is a faith that prays. It's a faith that persists. It's a faith that prevails. Look at verse 8 of Luke 18. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. He will avenge them speedily. First John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5 says this, talking about faith. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. 
So you say, Chris, these are desperate days. Yes, there's already a scarcity of faith. Chris, what is real faith? It's faith in the facts of the Word of God and the God who wrote the Bible who has already overcome the world, and I am in him who overcame the world. That is my faith. Not in America, but in God, Jehovah God of the Bible. And so, this is how we overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. God's faithfulness. Jesus said in John 16, These things I have spoken to you, that what? The preposition... In me, you may have peace. In the world, you might have tribulation. He didn't say that. What did he say? You will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Be happy. Why? Because I have what? Overcome the world. And where are you? In Christ Jesus. The truth is this. We're already on the victory side. But we're living our life on this earth, and we're looking for His coming again. But positionally, my friend, it is finished. God sees you and me already in heaven in Christ Jesus, seated by His right hand. But on this earth, in our condition, we're still what's called in progressive sanctification and walking and living our life by faith in Him and in the faith of the Word of God and Desperate, dark days are right at our shores, right in front of us. But we know that he's overcome it, and we're going to walk and be cheerful in it. So, you say, Chris, we find ourselves in a strong current going the wrong way. Absolutely. But remember, he is the great I am, and he's everything that you need. Uh, You can take uh, the sentence, I am, and you can put a blank behind it, and you can put anything in that blank that you want to. I just need patience. I am your patience. Well, I need assurance. I am your assurance. I need to overcome fear. I am your security. Whatever you need, whatever's troubling you, He is your answer. Why? Because He's the great I Am. And look, you're in I Am, and I Am is in you. The victory's won. You see, He did not say I was. And He didn't say I will be. He said what? I Am. For you and me, 2012, right in the midst of this political climate that we're in, not knowing what's just about to happen, We can rest in the fact that I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. It's like being on the Mayflower. Luke chapter 17, verses 5 through 6. Jesus talking here said, There's nothing that can stand in the way of this kind of faith that we're talking about. The apostles said to the Lord, they said, Increase our faith. And this is what the Lord said. He said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. You know what Jesus is saying? The disciples are saying, increase our faith. Jesus is saying here, it is not so much of the quantity of faith, but of its quality. It is not the question of getting more faith, but using the faith that you have. See, You can beg, plead, and do all kind of things to try to increase your faith. You don't need to do that. Why? I am your faith. You're in Christ. Christ is in you. He is your faith. Yield to it. Walk in it. Let Him exercise His faith in and through you. So, real faith, praise, persist, and prevails. Third and last thing is this, the experience of faith. We've talked about the scarcity of faith. we talked about real faith. Lastly, the experience of faith. Notice again what he said in Luke 18, verse 8, right there at the end. Shall he find faith on the earth? Notice it says on the earth. 
You see, heavenly faith certainly, most certainly, works in earthly situations. Heavenly faith most certainly works in heavenly situations. Think about it. In Noah's day, it was evil. In Lot's day, it was evil. And in our day, it's evil. In verse 30 of chapter 17 of Luke, it says, Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. You know what it's saying? I believe He's coming soon. And it's saying, in the, even though it's a parable here, but what it's talking about is what Jesus is saying, when I do come, there's going to be a scarcity of faith. 17 verse 30. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. What is he talking about? Evil. Evil. Do you think it's evil today? Or is it my imagination? My goodness, it is evil. I tell you what's happened to us. We're like the frog in the kettle. Everybody knows this. You put a frog in a kettle and begin to turn the heat up, he won't jump out. He'll just sit there and accommodate himself. Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. He accommodated himself, and they love, his family loves Sodom and Gomorrah. You take a frog and you put him in a bowl of water, he'll try his best to get out. Shocked to his senses. This is what's happened to us. We've been trying for so long to build big buildings with millions of dollars. And then once we got it built and celebrated, not really thinking and talking much about the bank loan, Now, oh my goodness, 30 days, the first payment's going to be due. We've got to get people to fill this place up. Why? So we can share the gospel with them, so we can grow them up in Christ? No, so we can get the mortgage payment. Well, how are we going to get them in? Well, y'all go figure that out. Well, we're going to need entertainment. Well, how much entertainment do we need? Well, I don't know. Go look and see what other churches are doing. And just do it just a little bit better. Listen, my friend, you can't outdo Disney. We don't have enough money to outdo Disney. And look, most people in America have already been to Disney. How are you going to ever excite them and do things enough to make them want to come when they've already been to Disney and they don't even have to go anymore? They can watch their iPhones and and television and the latest movies that look so real and all this. How's the church going to compete with that? We can't. Don't even try. And so, we've spent a lot of money building a lot of things, making things nicer, soccer fields. I mean, you name it, we've got it all. Thinking we're going to get our children, we're going to keep our children. My friend, listen, when I was coming along, if you said, Mom and Dad, I don't want to go to church. Well, first of all, you wouldn't say it. But number two, if you did say it, you would have got whipped all the way to the church. But nowadays, parents are afraid of their own children. There's even a sitcom out there that shows children running the household because moms and dads are afraid of their own kids. Fear of rejection from children who are immature. Novice. And now those novices tell us how we're going to do church if you're going to keep us. We're upside down, we're backwards. And we're spending millions and billions of dollars to try to attract and hold people. And we're not getting much for our money, are we? 86% of our kids leave our churches when they go off to college, those of you who are graduating. They do not come back to the church until they've graduated, they've gotten married, they've got a couple of kids, they're having marital problems, then they go to church hoping to get some help with their problems. 86%. And so... We find ourselves in an evil day. But see, nobody wants to say it. Why? This is why. Because if you say it, who's going to be drawn to that kind of preaching or teaching? Nobody. Who wants to come hear that? That's negative. 
I'd rather hear your best life now. God will help you up. He'll just get you up. He's not going to tell you to repent. He's just going to get you back up. So, there's the experience of faith. It was evil in Noah's day. It was evil in Lot's day. And Jesus said, when I come again, it's going to be the same. But we must say, for me, I will live and walk by faith. Amen? I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep teaching and preaching God's Word to men, women, boys, and girls, hoping to see people believe and be received into Christ, growing them up so that they can share with others. So, the experience of faith, well, physically, we're going to be okay. Look at uh, chapter 17 of Luke and look at verse 27. Again, it says, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. You know what this is saying? Life is going to go on. Yes, it's getting desperately evil and it's dark. We could be in martial law by the end of this year in this nation. Really? There's no reason it won't happen. Something's going to happen. But you know what? We're still going to, according to the Bible, right up to when Noah entered the ark, Lot came out of the city, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving to marriage. In other words, life was going on. Life is going to go on. God's going to make sure that you got what you need. You're going to be able to eat. You're going to be able to drink. God's going to take care of you physically. Remember the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. He said, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our, what? Daily bread. Each day, Lord, trusting you each day for daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You know what? The experience of faith is this. Yes, it's going to be dark. There's going to be a scarcity of faith. But God's going to take care of you physically. Don't worry about that. He's going to take care of you relationally. Again, it says in verse 27 of chapter 17, they married wives they were given in marriage. In other words... Life is going to continue to go on. God's going to take care of His remnant. We're going to be okay. But I want to remind you of something. This whole issue of faith. Lack of faith in marriage causes marriages to fail. When marriages fail, the family fails. When the family fails, what? The nation fails. When there is not trust in the workplace... The economy fails. Human relationships can only function when there is faith. Whether it's in marriage, whether it's in church life, whether it's out in the corporate world, it doesn't matter. There must be faith. And the Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. So, when you think of the experience of faith, there's physically relationally, but also materially. Look again at uh, Luke 17, 28. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they builded. And so, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built. You know what James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17 says? He says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. What you say is this. My faith in God says, God, if it's your will... This is what we'll do. My faith is in you, though. It's not in the stock market that's going down. 
It's not in your 401Ks, your retirement account, that's not doing very well. Your faith is in God, amen? It's in God. But now you who boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So, the destruction of the generation of Noah and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah shows this. A nation has to be destroyed when faith dies. It won't work without faith. Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 and 21. The Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great. Somehow Sodom and Gomorrah, we can't understand this fully. It was despicable. Uh, What did Billy Graham's wife, Ruth, says? If God doesn't punish America, he'll have to what? Apologize to what? Sodom and Gomorrah. Back in those days, the outcry for Sodom and Gomorrah was so great. It says in Genesis, because their sin is very grave. What did he say? He said, I will what? Go down. Think about our nation. Think what's happening now in Greece, all across Europe. Think about what Russia is up to now, and China, and Iran, and Korea. Think about little Israel. They're surrounded by people who hate them, who believe that they must cease to exist. Do you not know God hears the outcries? And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down. My friend Jesus is coming. He's coming. He's coming very soon. Will he find faith? According to this parable, Verse 8 of Luke 18, it seems to presume that he's not. According to what I see in Southern Baptist life, with the increase of worldliness in our churches, I believe that he's not going to find it either. I'm not discouraged. I don't want you to be discouraged. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe faith. In God, believe also in me. Listen. Don't live saying, I'm just not going to think about this. That's like people who won't go into a funeral home and and look at a loved one in a cat. I'm just, I'm not going up there. You ever been around somebody like that? They're just kind of spooky. Look, desperate days are heading our way. Dark days, as Dr. Rogers used to say, it is getting gloriously dark. Man, he used to say that years ago. And look how much time has passed now. It's getting darker. You say, Chris, why do you want to talk about this? This makes me scared. This makes me negative. This makes me feel negative. Why do you want to talk about it? Because I'm supposed to. It's in the Word of God. But remember, He's overcome the world. And you're in Him. Amen? It's going to be okay. You're going to have what you need physically. You're going to have what you need materially and relationally. God's going to take care of you. You may not be living high, wide, and handsome. But for those of you who came through the depression, we'll make it, won't we? And our faith in God will be stronger, right? Amen. You've been listening to Abiding Above Ministries with Chris Hodges. If you would like Chris to speak at your church or event, please go to our website, abidingabove.org. God bless you and make you a blessing.